Therefore, it is now time for question period. The member from Nepean Carlton. Today, obviously, um, to, to the acting premier, I rise today, obviously, on the news of a uh, increase to the hydro rates here in the province of Ontario, one. yet again making it more unaffordable. Which brings me to my next point: as the minister responsible for energy cavalierly suggests that the cancelled gas plants are a mere cup of coffee a year, I find that profound sense of entitlement has expanded into the rest of the government. After rereading the Premier's answers from question period yesterday, I am left with far more questions. In fact, the closer the questions probed into what the Premier knew about the deleted hard drives and when she knew it, she decided to wave off to the government House leader. Specifically, it is unclear to us what the Premier does not why the Premier does not want to detail conversations Question. with the Chair of Transition Monique Smith had, either with her or David Livingston. Will the Premier offer her cooperation at, today and ensure the former McGuinty Government House Leader, Chair of her Transition Team, Thank you. to Washington, Monique Smith, Thank will you. return to this chair? Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Premier. Governor House Leader. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the Premier has been extremely cooperative when it comes to the issue of uh, the gas plants. I can tell you as House Leader, it was the new Premier who directed me to work with the opposition to establish uh, the Justice Committee with a broad mandate. It can, as members know, meet at the call of the Chair, meaning it has absolute freedom when to meet. And like any committee of this Legislature, Mr. Speaker, it can call forward uh, uh, witnesses. There's a process in place to work to schedule them, and they have certain powers and authority if people uh, do not want to be forthcoming. But, Mr. Speaker, I would remind the member that in terms of this government, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Order has been there several times. I've been in front of the committee. Other ministers have been. And most importantly, yes, Mr. Speaker, the Premier has been twice in front of the committee. Thank you. Supplementary. I asked the government, uh, Acting Premier, if Monique Smith would appear before our committee and if she would recall her from Washington, I did not hear an answer. But I did hear the government House Leader tell us that they have expanded the role of the committee. Right now, the committee is trying Minister to without portfolio, government members come are to order. and therefore, after my leave, I will have to go back down to that committee because they refuse to allow us to sit next week. That's what's going on in their committee. Last week, yesterday, the Peter Wallace said, quote, I indicated that for successful Premier there would be a series of challenges, and these challenges are already known. A little later, he said, with reference to the gas plants, we would distinguish and we would talk to them about the records of which the Ontario Public Service was particularly concerned, which requests made by the Legislative Committee. I asked the Acting Premier, when did Manek Smith tell the Question. Premier about David Livingston's plan to delete the hard drives so that these records would not be made available? Thank you. Thank you. Government House Leader. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the member needs to be very, very careful. There is an active OPP investigation. Coming in here, Mr. Speaker, and throwing as much mud as possible and seeing what sticks is not an advisable strategy. Mr. Speaker, we have cooperated fully with the committee. Members of the government who have been called have made themselves available. I am certain that Manick Smith, as a, uh, uh, an employee of this government, will make herself available and work with the committee uh, to schedule an appearance. But, Mr. Speaker, if the honourable member wants to talk about the committee, we are still waiting for the Conservative candidate candidates to come before the committee, Mr. Speaker. I believe, Mr. Speaker, I'll have to check my notes, but I believe one candidate has been asked 16 times to come forward and refuse, Mr. Speaker. We have a number of questions for him about the Progressive Conservatives promise to cancel the gas plants in the last election. Final supplementary. I would remind the government House Leader it is not the Progressive Conservative Party under OPP investigation. It is members of his party that are under an OPP $1.1 billion gas plant cancellation scandal that saved their finance minister's seat and four other seats in a minority parliament that struck to the very heart of our democracy in this province. If he wants to talk about cooperating in the Justice Committee, he should have his members who are filibustering as I speak in this place to stand down, allow us to sit next week, and bring them next step into the Thank you. Thank you. The member from Halton will come to order. The member from Leeds Grenville will come to order.
and I'm keeping track. Minister of Energy, come to order. I'd, I'd like you to stop. Thank you. Coming up. Mr. Speaker, you know, the honourable member has been here for many years. She still hasn't learned that saying it louder doesn't make it more true, Mr. Speaker. The fact of the matter, Mr. Speaker, was it was her party that had robocalls in the last election saying the only way to get rid of the gas plants is to vote progressive conservative. It was her party that was putting out tweets, that was putting out press releases in the pièce de résistance, Mr. Speaker. It was her leader who went on YouTube, Mr. Speaker, to say that if he is elected premier of this province, that gas plant, and he pointed to it, Mr. Speaker, with a dramatic flourish, would be done, done, done. Mr. Speaker, every party of this House made the same promise, Mr. Speaker, and all we want to hear from their candidates is what was their costing, Mr. Speaker, and what was their policy analysis. The, uh, the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek will come to order, along with everyone else. New question. Member for from London, Thank you very much, and bon pack, everyone in the legislature. Speaker, my question is the Minister of Consumer Services. Minister, in six years now, my daughter will be learning how to drive, and I can tell you, as any parent, that will be a most frightening day. From the moment our kids are born, we all go through great lengths to ensure their health and safety. And the prospect of any child getting on the road for the first time with all the dangers present is a difficult reality for any parent to face. So many parents enroll their children in driver's ed to help them prepare. However, the Star revealed today that the Transportation Ministry won't let the public know about unfit driving instructors who have had their licenses revoked. Minister, since the Ministry of Transportation won't, will you stand up and act to ensure the safety for our young drivers? The Minister of uh, Northern Development and Mines. Thank you. Here. I'm, not, I'm actually pleased to try and respond to this question, and certainly I, I think it's important to note the Minister uh, of Transportation takes the issue very seriously. Uh, there is a, there obviously is an issue related to uh, the Privacy Commissioner, and there's a process underway which cannot be circumvented, so it is before the Commissioner. Difficult to comment in any more substantial way, and certainly, as we all do, we respect the, uh, uh, the people's right to privacy as well as the public's right to information. Uh, a number of things are clear. A driving uh, school must be licensed by the ministry in order to offer beginner driver education. It is the school's responsibility to ensure that the instructors they employ are being uh, properly licensed. There is a very close monitoring of the schools, and changes are made, are made as they are necessary to keep the schools in line with provincial standards. And uh, certainly, it's important for cons consumers to make uh, an informed choice. There is a, a list. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, this is typical of the government. You ask a question about transportation, you ask a question about protecting consumer rights, and we get the Minister of Northern Mines Northern yeah, Mines uh, answering the questions. Wow. My next question to the Minister of Health will probably go to the Minister of Natural Resources to get an answer. It's ridiculous, this government. <laughs> Minister, our children are learning to drive. We put the safety in the hands of our driving instructors. Minister, you can help me, but why don't you answer the question yeah. next time? Minister, yeah, yeah. we expect our children to learn to drive from someone who is professional and licensed by the government. Therefore, every parent puts in their trust to the Minister of Transportation to ensure that people teaching our young drivers adhere to standards of conduct and bad instructors are removed. Yet in the Toronto Star, over a year, for over a year I've been trying to obtain the names of roughly 300 instructors who have lost their licenses. These instructors have lost their licenses for reasons ranging from sexist and obscene language with students to selling alcohol and contraband cigarettes. Whoa. Ministry will not act to protect their people. Ministry, why can't a parent find out which instructor has lost his license because they visit a strip club during a car wow. Thank you. Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, I mean, the member, I think, should understand, and certainly can, should understand that the issue uh, is, is in front of the Privacy Commissioner, and, and it's, a, it's certainly not appropriate for anybody to circumvent the process of the Privacy Commissioner. You would understand that. And, uh, and obviously, we need to uh, respect that process. The fact is that uh, uh, there is a list of approved drivers' uh, education schools, as well as those uh, whose status has been revoked, that is posted on the MTO website. That is there for, for all to see. And certainly, Choosing a school from uh, from that list is is certainly the, the the safest way. I think it's fair to say to ensure that young drivers are being taught by approved schools and by licensed instructors. This is an important issue, Mr. Speaker. Uh, one that again uh, uh, is taken seriously by the minister, and uh, again a process that's in front of the privacy commissioner. Thank you. Final supplement. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, I don't know why the minister herself could not read those notes to me. I had to pass it off to the minister of mining and northern development. However, minister, I understand why your government isn't transparent when it comes to the gas plants. You're looking out for your own skin. However, we're talking about the safety of our young drivers. At the very least, we expect the government to be open about that. In the world of the internet, how is it not possible there's not an online ministry database where parents can find out if their child's instructor is licensed or not? It stuns me that this simple common sense approach eludes the ministry and this government. Minister, why does your ministry ministry continue to fail our children. Minister. Uh, well, again, Mr. Speaker, this is an issue that I think everyone takes seriously, and there is a process underway with the Privacy Commissioner. But the fact is, I mean, and, and Minister Murray, were you here, would very much want to uh, to affirm the fact that we monitor the the driver education schools very, very closely, and uh, and do make changes as necessary to uh, keep uh, those schools in line with provincial standards. Uh, certainly, consumers are in a position, I think, to make an informed choice. There is a list of uh, approved drivers education schools, as well as those whose status has been revoked on the MTO website. So certainly uh, choosing a school from that list, I think, is the, uh, uh, the best way to ensure that uh, young drivers are being taught by uh, approved schools and licensed instructors. Answer. Again, this is something that is under the purview and be looked at by the Privacy Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the um, as innocent as it was, I will, uh, to be consistent, I would ask and remind all members that you do not reference anyone's attendance in this House. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Last summer, on the advice of Sean Truax, the Forensic Coordinator for the Province of Ontario, computers were seized from an off-site government office in Ottawa at 180 Elgin Street. When did the government learn of this, Speaker? Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, I can speak uh, only for myself as Minister of Government Services. I learned of this uh, uh, particular uh, incident or the details of it this morning uh, from the Justice Committee hearings. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, I think members are aware there have been some media reports about the OPP undertaking their investigation. But I would remind the member again, as Minister, I have made sure that I have uh, stayed out of the OPP investigation. And in fact, I would, uh, I would uh, advise her to do the same thing. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, uh, these were the government's own experts who feared that a computer was being accessed and potentially wiped clean. So this is not the OPP that I'm asking about, Speaker. I'm asking about the government's own internal people. Surely the government's own experts briefed the minister responsible. Can the minister confirm that a briefing happened and when? Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there is and there was an active OPP investigation. I have uh, been very forthcoming, Mr. Speaker, that last summer I had a uh, discussion with my then Deputy Minister. He has since uh, retired from the public service. And he said, uh, as you know, uh, there is an OPP investigation going on, and our ministry will be uh, cooperating and doing some work with them. Do you wish to be brought up to speed? Do you wish to be briefed? What have you on it? And I said, absolutely not. Myself and my members of my staff want to stay out of the OPP investigation. It would be entirely inappropriate for me to know any of the details of that. But I did ask the Deputy Minister to make sure that the ministry cooperated fully with the Ontario Provincial Police as is Answer. appropriate. Mr. Speaker. Okay. Final supplementary. Speaker, can the Acting Premier tell us when he, whether any staff from the Premier 
Speaker's office. We're using those computers in Ottawa. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, I kind of anticipate this Perry Mason route that she's going down. Uh, and I know there was reference made, Mr. Speaker, to uh, the member from Ottawa South today at committee. I would like to, uh, Mr. Order. Speaker, put on the record, Mr. Speaker, that the court document makes very clear that uh, the OPP or the uh, ministry, uh, in cooperating with the OPP, looked at a total of 52 hard drives. And of those, they found 24 of them, Mr. Speaker, have been accessed through these codes, which are, of course, the topic of this investigation. I can assure uh, the leader of the third party that the member from Ottawa South at that point, who was working in Ottawa for the Premier, that his uh, computer was not accessed, Mr. Speaker, using these codes. No question. The leader of the third party. My next question is for the uh, acting premier speaker. But I can tell you that the mocking of the opposition in the job that they're trying to do to hold this government to account on a 1.1 billion dollar scandal looks very bad on the government. It's very bad. Can the acting premier speaker tell us who was accessing those computers in Ottawa? Deputy premier. Government house leader. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think what looks what looks really bad, Mr. Speaker, is a leader of a political party who seems to be counselling the government to interfere into an OPP investigation and seems disappointed, Mr. Speaker, that we decided not to interfere in an OPP investigation. The fact of the matter, Mr. Speaker. The fact of the matter, Mr. Speaker, is that the OPP identified 24 computers that have been accessed, and if the honourable member wants to consult the court document that was released, the list of the individuals who owned or who, who yes, used sir. those computers is right there. The committee was asked, Mr. Speaker, I understand, to confirm whether the member from Ottawa South's computer was one that had been accessed, and I Thank can you. tell you, Mr. Speaker, I consulted with officials, Thank and you. it was not. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker. I don't know about you, but I think that there's a real duty that's uh, called the ministerial responsibility for a minister to know what's happening within his own minister, and there's a dereliction of duty when it comes to his minister. <laughs> Can the acting premier speaker tell us what sort of information might have been found on those computers in Ottawa? Yeah. Minister? Mr. Speaker, again, I think what looks bad is a leader of the third party who is trying to conduct an OPP investigation here on the floor of the House. What also looks bad, Mr. Speaker, is a leader of the NDP who decides that, uh, that playing these OPP games is more important, Mr. Speaker, than asking about health or asking about education or asking about transportation or asking about the issues of the day. The fact of the matter, Mr. Speaker, is the court document is clear. There were a number of computers that were accessed through these codes, which is at the centre of the investigation. It even lists who they were. As to the details of the investigation, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to leave that to the Ontario Provincial Police, as is appropriate, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to allow them to do their work, and I'm going to allow them Answer. to reach their own conclusions and not interfere as the leader of the third party. Thank you. Suggesting Final I do. supplementary. Speaker, only the Liberals could be so arrogant and out of touch as to consider the work the opposition's doing as being a game. Speaker, it's not a game. It is our responsibility to do this work, Speaker. Our responsibility, and we take it seriously. This government story gets more remarkable by the day. They claim they don't know anything about the investigation that their own staff are running. They claim they hardly even know Dalton McGuinty anymore and the other Liberals that they work with for a decade. And if we're keeping track, they're also so surprised that cancelling the gas plants were going to cost $1.1 billion. And I imagine they had no idea that Kathleen Wynne's signature was going to be ending up on that final deal. Order. The people stuck paying the Question. higher and higher hydro bills in this province aren't surprised at all. When is this government going to start answering Thank questions? You. you know, maybe it's time the leader of the New Democratic Party got a little bit off her high horse, Mr. Speaker. 
The advice to not interfere in an OPP investigation is not coming from me, Mr. Speaker. It is coming from the Ontario Provincial Police, the same Ontario Provincial Police which recently appeared in front of the Justice Committee and said the type of interference that we're seeing here in this legislature could, in fact, jeopardize the investigation, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the New Democratic Party cannot have it both ways, Mr. Speaker. She cannot ask for the police to look into it and reach conclusions and then come in here and interfere it through inappropriate questions, Mr. Speaker, by not dealing with the facts and dealing, Mr. Speaker, with this issue the way she has. If anyone needs to apologize, Answer. Mr. Speaker, it's the leader of the New Democratic Thank Party. You. Your question, the member from Nipissing. Thank you very much, and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Finance Minister. Yesterday, the Bank of Canada revised its uh, growth outlook downward from 2.5 per cent to 2.3 per cent. It comes on the heel of a Fraser Institute report that concludes Ontario is dragging down the rest of Canada's economy. Now we know our revenues are down and will continue to go down. We also know you have a $4.5 billion gap in the budget, the one that you kept secret from the financial community. Knowing all these shortfalls, your response is to go on a $5.7 billion spending spree, just like the BLT document we exposed said you would. So, Minister, Ontarians have figured it out. Your math simply does not add Question. up. When are you going to come clean and admit to this legislature you have no plan to save Ontario from the trouble you got us into? Thank you. Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, uh, We've had a, a budget that we presented last year that illustrated that we had exceeded our targets year over year. In fact, last year, we not only did that, we became the lowest cost government because of the efforts that we've taken in terms of austerity. We've been very disciplined and determined in doing so. We also recognize, and I just re provided a report at the, uh, financial, at the fall economic update, telling the world as to where we stand relative to our numbers, and again, we're on track to balance by 2017-18. We then came forward with a long-term plan illustrating the very challenges before us, all the while recognizing what we must do, Mr. Speaker, is invest in our future to ensure we have economic growth and greater prosperity. The opposition members on the other side would rather us cut investments into health care and education at the expense of Ontario public for their own personal yes, gain, sir. Mr. Speaker. That is not what we're going to do. It's not about the fortunes of that political party. It's the fortunes of Ontario that we're most concerned Thank about. You. Thank you, Speaker. Well, uh, we've already heard from uh, the government's Minister of Transportation that they will be cutting health and education, so we already know where those cuts are coming from, as well as seeing a flagrant disregard that this government has for taxpayers' money. And of course, First Minister, by that I mean the $1.1 billion gas plant scandal spent to save your very seat. All this when Ontario's per-person GDP is 5.6 per cent lower than the rest of Canada. We now have the third lowest rate of private sector job creation in the country. Our annual growth in business investment is barely half of the rest of Canada's. And your answer? You go on a spending spree while raising hydro rates and raising taxes. All the experts tell us that if Ontario adopts smarter policies, that's lower hydro rates and lower taxes, we could improve Question. our economy. Minister, will your budget reverse the disastrous path you've been leading us down? So, Mr. Speaker, um, Ontario has actually been uh, We've had over 180 percent of jobs returned to this province since the depth of the recession. We have taken steps necessary to grow our economy and create jobs, and our budget coming forward on May 1 at 4 o'clock in this very legislature will talk specifically about those measures, measures which the opposition failed to recognize. They failed to recognize that what we must do now is continue to invest in our economy, ensure that we have an open and dynamic business climate to attract those investments because the, the companies are and the jobs Jobs, especially small business, are the job creators. We're talking about more opportunity for all Ontarians, Mr. Speaker, not you more government, and we'll continue to listen. do just that. And furthermore, as we grow and invest in our economy, contrary to what they would prefer on that side, which is to do across-the-board cuts and put in jeopardy that recovery, we will continue to stand behind those businesses Thank and you. behind Ontario Thank public. 
you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. The Liberals have a long record of promising everything and delivering nothing. It's happening again on transit for Kitchener-Waterloo. On March 18, the Liberals promised all-day two-way GO service but gave us no timeline. Then they changed their mind and told us GO Express Rail won't serve Kitchener at all. Instead, the minister cooked up a new scheme to build high-speed rail in 10 years. And now a senior vice president with GO tells us that we are lucky to have just four trains a day. Speaker, two-way, all-day GO, high-speed rail, or just four trains for the people of Kitchener-Waterloo? Deputy Premier. The Minister of uh, Transportation. Mr. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm uh, very out of breath, but very happy to be here. Um, we, are, uh, we, we are moving right now on track acquisition, as the member knows, uh, very advanced. Uh, we'll, we're, we're in the final stages. We will soon own 80 per cent of the track to Kitchener-Waterloo, and these have been very difficult negotiations. We're very excited. We are moving on two-way all day go, in spite of the federal government cutting back via at the same time we're increasing it. We are going to have high speed rail to Kitchener running at 320 kilometers, and London and Kitchener, and uh, we are over the next decade Answer. going to transform the transportation system of the province of Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Perhaps, perhaps the problem is, is that the minister doesn't understand what two-way all-day means. It means that 10,000 people who live in K Toronto can get to Kitchener-Waterloo in the morning that's because that's where there's jobs, and then the people from Kitchener-Waterloo can actually get to Toronto all day long. Right now, there's four trains, and it's clear the Liberals have lost their way. They'll promise everything, they'll deliver nothing because they focus on keeping their own jobs rather than creating jobs for Ontario. Speaker, the city's of Kitchener, Waterloo and Guelph have been clear. They're calling for full-day, two-way GO train service on the Kitchener line. Even the government admits all-day GO will create 33,000 jobs. But instead of working with our community to fund the local plan, the Liberals are busy promising everything else Question. to distract from their own record of waste. Stop the clock. Minister of Education will come to order. The member from Eglinton Lawrence will come to order. No, you're not helping. Wrap up, please. Thank you. There are 33,000 jobs at play, but instead of working with our community to fund the local plan, the Liberals are busy promising everything else to distract from their own Thank you. waste, delay, and mismanagement. Thank you. Why are you refusing? Thank you. Minister. Yeah, I, I, I want to thank the member for the friendly question, um, and, and I, I want to ask her if she can take yes for an answer. Apparently not. So I would be very clear. We are doing all-day two-way go. That's already underway. We, we already have trains running. That will be. Yes, it is happening. Expenditures have been made for years. They're accelerating. Not because of her question. No, no. I meet with Carl Zayer, Ken Sealing, Mayor Fontana, Mayor Farbridge, my friend John Malloy, Liz Sandals, Deb Matthews. We have been working with this community and business leaders for a year, not just consulting, working with them. They want high-speed rail. They're getting four stations, access to Pearson Airport in under half an hour from London, about an hour from London, hour and 10 minutes from London, downtown to Pearson, Answer. 320 kilometer an hour trains, Canadian technology. We're kicking butt, Mr. Speaker. We're getting it done. No question. The member from Scarborough Gilbert. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour. For many community groups and organizations, April 16th marks. Stop. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek will come to order second time, and the member from Trinity Spadina. Uh, the member from Eglinton Lawrence can just. I don't need your help. 
Equal Pay Day is recognized in countries around the world, including the United States, Australia, member states of the European Union. And yesterday, we became the first province in Canada to recognize this important reminder of gender pay gap. As you may know, this date was chosen by community groups to represent the amount of extra days per year, on average, women must work annually to match annual earnings of men. Through you, Speaker, can the minister tell this House and women in my riding across Ontario what your ministry is doing to improve the position of women in the workplace and to improve pay equity in the Question. province? Question. Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the fine member from scarborough gilwood for the great question. Our government recognizes the valuable contribution that women make in making a more equal, a more just, and a more prosperous society right here in Ontario. I know in the supplementary, the minister responsible for women's issues can speak more broadly to the investments that have been made to improve the status of women in Ontario. But let me say, Speaker, I'm very proud that my ministry is taking action to improve the status quo of all workers, including yeah. women, yeah, yeah. by proposing changes to labour legislation to help vulnerable workers and by increasing the minimum wage. I'd also like to commend our employees at the Pay Equity Office for the hard work they've undertaken investigating, settling, resolving complaints re related to the compensation of employees yeah, 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 in what are traditionally female-dominated occupations. Excellent. There's always more to be done, and that's why we've asked the Pay Equity Office to hold a roundtable to discuss ways to address the gender wage gap. Yes, sir. And I was really happy to be a part of that discussion. I look forward to some excellent advice, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. I know that our government has taken a very important step by increasing the minimum wage. With the majority of minimum wage earners being women, this increase has a direct impact. Speaker, I am also proud that we are helping women in the workplace by strengthening workplace protections. I know the Pay Equity Office, and as the Minister said, is working very hard when it comes to advising employers and employees about their rights and responsibilities. However, Speaker, even with all of these important initiatives, the gender wage gap still exists. Through you, Speaker, will the Minister share what our government is doing Question. to address this wage disparity and ensure that women can participate fully in the economy? Thank you, Minister. Speaker, the minister responsible for women's issues. Responsible for women's issues. Thank you, and thank you for allowing me the uh, second part to the question, and thank you to the member from Scarborough Guildwood for the question on this issue as well. I'd like to first thank the Pay Equity Commission for the roundtable that they hosted yesterday that myself and the Minister of Labour attended. Look forward to the recommendations that come from that. Our government has taken actions. We've taken concrete actions to improve women's economic status and help close the gender wage gap, a lot more than has been done in the past, Mr. Speaker. We've demonstrated this commitment by helping women access better jobs through major investments in education, training programs, and the Pay Equity Commission. Thousands of women have, have been provided with training and education yes, for better jobs. Our government is also investing significantly in child care and full-day kindergarten. We will continue to work hard to break down Thank all you. of these barriers for women of today and leaders of tomorrow. Thank you. New question. The member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Acting Premier, since you've been in power, the Auditor General has released special reports investigating Orange Air Ambulance the Mississauga gas plant and the Oakville gas plant. In all three of these cases, the flow of public funds to indirect recipients and third-party service providers was outside the current mandate of the provincial auditor. Acting Premier, do you agree that the Auditor General should be given the tools to do their job and ensure that taxpayers are getting fair value for their money? Uh, Deputy Premier. Minister of Government Services. Minister of Government thank Services. You, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I know that the honourable member has a, uh, a private member's bill, which is uh, 
before uh, the Legislature this afternoon, and I think all of us look forward to uh, the debate and the discussion. I think all of us recognize the important role that's played by uh, the Auditor General. Uh, we also anticipate a very important role by the Financial Accountability Officer. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, we do have to uh, uh, balance that with the appropriateness of uh, going too far when it comes to those who are merely dealing with the government and not part of the government. That is the balance, I think, that will be the topic of debate this afternoon. And I can certainly say on our side of the legislature, Mr. Speaker, we're looking forward to hearing the debate and the presentation from the member, as well as participating in it. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, to the Acting Premier. A number of audits are currently in progress, including a review of the community care access centres, smart meter usage, and the Winter Roads Maintenance Program. These investigations all involve public money flowing to third-party organizations. Acting Premier, my private member's bill will allow the Auditor General to follow the money to third-party recipients to help complete these audits and make sure taxpayers are getting good value for their money. Yeah. Acting Premier, will you support Bill 190 when it is debated for second reading this afternoon and give the Auditor General the tools to do their job? Yeah. Minister of Government Services. Minister of Finance, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, it's, uh, it's important that we all recognize the need for greater transparency and greater accountability. It's one of the reasons that we in this House, on this side of the House, have taken numerous steps to, to do so. In fact, CD Howe Institute has recognized that the government of Ontario has become one of the most transparent, one of the most accountable governments anywhere in Canada. We've been rated top in the country because of the integrity of our numbers. We recognize the important work that the Auditor General does. It's one of the reasons we brought forward the Financial Accountability Officer to ensure that we get not only an Auditor General looking at the past results, but also making certain that going forward, we institute proper systems to ensure that integrity continues. And we're doing that in Treasury Board. We're doing Answer. that with our sub Treasury Board Committee will continue to act responsibly yeah. for the benefit of the public good and taxpayers' value will be protected. Thank New you. Mr. Question. The member from Bramley, Gore, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My, my question is to the Acting Premier. The Liberals continue to insist that they want openness and transparency in the waste of the $1.1 billion gas plant scandal and in the deletion and wiping of emails and, and, hardware, and hard drives. But today, their actions tell a different story. Today, they tried to stop the Justice Committee from sitting. Ontarians deserve answers, and th we, they did not let this happen today. Why did the Liberal members spend the morning trying to stop the Justice Committee from sitting? Deputy Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to bring the honourable member and, in fact, all members of the legislature up to speed. The fact of the matter is that the Justice Committee has decided to sit next week, uh, Wednesday morning and afternoon and Thursday afternoon, Mr. Speaker. And what members may find a little bit curious, and perhaps members of the press or the public, is how could the committee meet during question period? Well, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, that the committee has that power and authority. The reason why it has that power and authority? Because I, as House Leader, negotiated with the opposition, Mr. Speaker, on the direction of the Premier, who said she wanted to have the committee to have that sort of responsibility to undertake to sit when it felt uh, when it felt it was in uh, the best interest, Mr. Speaker, and Order. we're going to see it hold a number of hearings next week. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker. Well, just to inform the, uh, the government House leader, I was actually in the committee, and members of the Liberal Party voted against sitting oh. and that just voted, they voted against that. So their actions tell a different story. They talk about getting answers for the gas plant, but they said no to a public inquiry. They talked about being transparent and open, but they voted against sitting additional days in the Justice Committee. Why are the government saying one thing about accountability and transparency, but doing another? Why are they voting against transparency? Why are they against accountability? Mr. Speaker, again, we have a Justice Committee, and it may sound arcane, Mr. Speaker, but it meets at the call of the chair. What that means, Mr. Speaker, is it's up to the committee to decide when it meets. I would also, Mr. Speaker, advise members of the legislature, if they haven't noticed, there's more of the opposition than the government, more of them than us, which, which essentially means the opposition, Mr. Speaker, is helping to drive the agenda of this committee. But at the same time, Mr. Speaker, I think 
All of us would agree, let's let the committee undertake its own work. And I would ask the honourable member, uh, as this is question period, I'm very, very surprised that he has no issues about education, Mr. Speaker, or health care, or a variety of issues that he wants to raise in the House today. But, Mr. Answer. Speaker, I'm always happy to answer questions about committee procedure. Thank you. Your question, the member from Etobicoke North. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the, for the Attorney General. Madam Minister Mayo. And access to justice are important issues across Ontario. As you will know, Speaker, as a, and as former Speaker Peters will know, Mr. Frank Yakubuchki released a report recently that outlines important recommendations lighting the path to increased Aboriginal representation in the justice system. I understand that the Ministry of the Attorney General has established an implementation committee to address Mr. Yakubuchki's recommendations, as well as announced the announcement of the co-chairs of the Justice Advisory Group to provide advice to the Attorney General on broader justice issues affecting First Nations. Speaker, my question is this. Will the Attorney General inform this chamber about the steps we are taking to fortify, solidify, and strengthen the relationship between Aboriginal peoples and the justice system? Thank you. Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from uh, Etobicoke North for his uh, question. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Yakabuski report has helped the ministry build on its ongoing efforts to improve participation of First Nation individuals on jury roles and strengthen our province's justice system overall. The new assistant, we have created a position of Assistant Deputy Attorney General for Aborigin Aboriginal Justice, and this uh, individual will be recruited through an open, merit-based process beginning this month. This is the first recommendation to be implemented in consultation with the Jury Review Implementation Committee, formed last September 2013, to oversee the implementation of recommendation in Mr. Yakabuski report. And I want to take this opportunity yes, to uh, thank uh, Judge Yakabuski for his uh, wonderful report. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Merci, Madame. Thank you, Mr. Minister, for your answer and your contribution of uh, Mr. Yakabush. Our government is taking meaningful steps towards effecting real positive change in the way the First Nations participate in Ontario's justice system, specifically in enhancing participation on juries. We know, for example, that throughout Ontario, First Nations peoples are significantly underrepresented, not just on juries, but among all those who work in administration of justice, uh, court officials, prosecutors, defense counsel, and judges. Speaker, can the minister expand on how moving forward on these particular recommendations will help build inclusive and respectful relationships with our partners in the Aboriginal communities? Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you. M minister of minister. Aboriginal Affairs. Sir of Aboriginal Affairs. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the addition of an Assistant Deputy Attorney General Aboriginal Justice is a critical step in addressing the Aboriginal justice issues. It fulfills a key recommendation of the Justice Yakabuchi report. It will do two things, this new position. The position will strengthen relationships between Aboriginal communities and government. Number two, it will improve trust and understanding amongst Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people and communities. And number three, it will lead to new supports and programs for Aboriginal peoples. <clears throat> As a part of the effort to find the best possible candidate for this position, the recruitment process will include extensive outreach to Aboriginal organizations and communities across Canada. Speaker, my colleague, the Attorney General, and I will continue to move forward in implementing the recommendations of the report. We will continue Answer. to work to ensure that First Nations are adequately represented in Ontario's justice system. Thank you. New question. The member from Perth, Wellington. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Attorney General. My private member's uh, resolution called on the government to implement a comprehensive long-term solution to, joint, uh, to reform joint and several liability insurance for municipalities, and to do it by this June. It received overwhelming support from AMO, from the Insurance Bureau of Canada, from insurers in Perth, Wellington, and beyond, and from over 200 municipalities. Support continues to, to pour in. It was debated and received overwhelming support from MPPs from all parties. That was almost two months ago. Since you became Attorney General, what action have you taken on this file 
and well, when will you get it done? Good question. Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, legal liability reform is an important and complex issue. I understand that it, this issue has uh, been a significant uh, concern of municipality for some time, and the uh, AMO has asked the government to consider the impact of the law uh, of uh, joint and several liability on municipal insurance. The Ministry of the Attorney General has worked with AMO to develop possible ways to address municipal concern. MAG is in process of consulting with AMO and the legal community on two options under consideration, and the consultation period has been extended Answer. and is expected to, uh, co to be concluded uh, on uh, Thursday, uh, April 16, 2014. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. With all due respect, Speaker, that's the same answer I heard four years ago yeah. when I was a councillor in North Perth. That hasn't changed. Speaker, I know this minister is new to the job, but we need to know when she will make this happen. Her government has been promising reform for years, but they have never made it a priority. I hope she will do better. AMO and many municipalities are— Just, uh, The minister without portfolio, you can't hopscotch heckle. So just— I hear you wherever you are. Thank you, Speaker. AMO and many municipalities are supporting a combined model, which, yep. would, replace reason, which would place reasonable limits on the damages that could be recovered from a municipality. In Perth, Wellington, municipalities, including Stratford and the County of Wellington, are asking you to support this. Yep. Minister, the time for consultations is over. Question? When will you respect the will of the House? Time is running out. As the member said, there is some municipality who are supporting it and some who are not supporting it. So, we have been examining a model used in other jurisdictions. We have examined a model used in the United States in particular, and they have a wide range of approaches. Proportionate liability in which each defendant is only liable for the proportion of damage he or she has caused is controversial because it can mean that a seriously injured plaintiff has to absorb a significant loss. We have looked at what is done in Saskatchewan. So, as I said, you know, we are consulting, we are working with, uh, with the official in my ministry, and uh, we will uh, inform the, uh, the member later on. Thank you. New question. Member from Niagara Falls. Speaker, my question to, is to the Acting Premier. The Niagara Region has one of the highest unemployment rates in Ontario. City councillors in St. Catharines unanimously passed a motion to develop jobs and investment strategy. By cooperating with the Niagara Region, other municipalities, and the Niagara Industrial Association, we met with Niagara businesses who support the NDP's plan of a targeted tax credit to create jobs. Niagara Regional leaders are taking their own measures to do what this government should be doing, creating jobs and a plan that works. Will this government finally admit it crosses, it's crossed the board, corporate tax cuts aren't creating jobs, and they'll tell regional leaders in Niagara how it will support their job strategy. Thank you, Deputy Premier. The Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. So Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Well, uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question as well. It's important to understand that Niagara is facing uh, unique challenges to that region, partly because of the, uh, the uh, dependence in the past and the presence on the manufacturing sector. And It's uh, refreshing as well to see the hard work that is being done by the citizens there and the political and uh, business leaders. In fact, uh, the, the, uh, the economic development corporations for the region as a whole have recently Quite exceptionally, Mr. Speaker, uh, increase their coordination, and they understand that by collaborating, they can actually compete even better as a region. And we're seeing, although the unemployment rate I acknowledge in the Niagara region is unacceptably high, it is coming down uh, considerably over the past year, and certainly since the height of the recession. And yes, it is sir. benefiting from the uh, job-creating uh, initiatives that this government is is making, as we see that unemployment employment rate Thank come you. down, and we see the growth in manufacturing jobs once. Thank Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, manufacturers in Niagara are saying they are in danger of being poached 
by the states across the border. Low power costs in New York State generated by Hydro One and sold at an enormous loss is being used to lure Niagara companies away. An industrial consumer in New York, in New York, can purchase electricity from Ontario 30 to 45 percent lower than a competing company in our province. Will this government fix its broken hydro system that is increasing hydro bills for Ontarians and, more importantly, driving manufacturing jobs out of Niagara and into the states? Thank you. Minister, uh, to the Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the uh, member needs to get his facts uh, up to speed. Mr. Speaker, uh, we had a broken system. We now have a, have a system that creates a surplus. We are now using that strong position in the electricity system, Mr. Speaker, to create a program called the IEI program. Mr. Speaker, that creates energy for people who are creating jobs, Mr. Speaker, at about 50% of the regular rate. And we've just announced seven across the province, including in Welland, Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, and in Pembroke, Renfrew, Mr. Speaker, uh, we've, we've created 140 jobs by using this program to, to restart uh, a, a, a paper plant that had been stopped, Mr. Speaker. We're, we're across the board competitive with our industrial uh, programs, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to evolve them, and we yes, are sir. competitive with northern states. We're competitive with other provinces in the industrial sector. I invite Thank the you. member to come to my office, and we'll review all the programs for them Thank and you. the benefits for the industrial. Thank you. New question. Member from Vaughan. Thanks very much, Speaker. Speaker, my uh, question today is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, for many seniors, physiotherapy can be the key to a full and active life, whether it's getting out of the house to get groceries, taking part in exercise and sports, or simply taking a stroll with their grandchildren. Thousands of older Ontarians benefit from the hard work and attentive care of our physiotherapists. And that's why so many people in Vaughan were concerned about the changes that our government made to the delivery of physiotherapy this past summer. Many spoke to me and wondered what this would mean for them. Would it interrupt their care? Would it make it harder for them to access services? Speaker, yesterday I had the distinct pleasure of announcing that our government will be investing $800,000 to support the addition of four new publicly funded physiotherapy clinics in my riding of Vaughan. I know how important this will be for so many living in my community. Speaker, could the minister please tell the House just how this investment will benefit seniors in Vaughan. Question. Thank you, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Vaughan, and I tell you, he is a passionate advocate for seniors in his community. Yeah. And I agree with the member that physiotherapy does help ensure older Ontarians lead healthy, active lives. Speaker, before we move forward with our plan to improve physiotherapy for Ontarians, seniors in many communities simply had no access to publicly funded clinic-based physiotherapy services. Wait lists for home-based physiotherapy were far too long. Now we're more than doubling the number of publicly funded physiotherapy clinics in the province. That means 90,000 more Ontarians will be able to receive clinic-based physiotherapy in their communities. In Vaughan, our investment will provide access to physiotherapy services to over 2,000 individuals. Wow. And at the same time, Answer. we're funding community care access centers to provide in home physiotherapy to 60,000 more people across the province. Thank you. This will help increase Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer, and I thank her for acknowledging the work that takes place in my community of on regarding supporting seniors. Just a couple of Fridays ago, Speaker, the Minister responsible for seniors and the Premier of Ontario were in my riding at a healthy seniors roundtable discussing issues of importance to seniors in my community. More than 700 showed up for that event, Speaker, wow, that's and I know great. they were delighted to hear about the work that we're doing for the Minister responsible and for the Premier. Right. Speaker, there's an, a growing aging population in Vaughan as there is in communities across the province. Ontario's aging population will put an increasing strain on health care resources in years to come. Now, I know that the Minister of Health has taken very strong and meaningful steps to ensure the successful delivery of the Mackenzie Vaughan Hospital, something very important to me and to my community. But there is a growing recognition that health promotion is vital to helping people uh, prevent people from going to the hospital in the first place or being readmitted after discharge. Could the minister please speak about other investments being made in Vaughan to help keep our seniors out of the emergency room? Thank you, Minister. Uh, speaker, the member is absolutely right in saying that the Mackenzie Vaughan Hospital will be delivered on time, and I can tell you he has uh, been pushing that project forward. 
But we, I think we all agree that we must do all we can to keep people out of the hospital in the first place. That's why this year, Speaker, we uh, increased our investment in home and community care by 6 per cent to ensure seniors can get high-quality care close to home. And we're creating community health links to provide collaborative care for the most complex patients. And as part of our physiotherapy reforms, we're expanding community exercise and falls prevention classes to more locations across Ontario. We will be able to offer this free, publicly funded service to 130,000 seniors, including 10,000 in the central uh, um, in the member's uh, area. We'll continue to work hard to ensure older Ontarians are able to access, uh, to lead healthy, active, independent lives in their own homes. Thank you. Your question, the member from Oshawa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have a question for the Minister of Training Colleges and University. Minister, as you're well aware, University of Ontario Institute of Technology was first established on the basis of a new model with Durham College, utilizing a shared services aspect for their facilities and operation. This worked well at the start, however, subsequent leadership at UOIT did not have the desire to allow the shared services model to continue. The end result is the splitting of the services, and Durham College had to pay over $3.2 million in additional unbudgeted costs only to have UOIT rehire Durham's severed staff. Minister is happening again, and this time the taxpayers in Durham College is anticipating paying an additional half a million dollars or more. Minister, can you commit to review the Durham College UIT operations and have all players act in the best interest of the taxpayers and in the original intent of the agreement? I would agree. Mr. Training College University. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question from the member. This is one of those questions I'm actually happy to get uh, in, in this legislature, unlike many others that we often get. And the reason why I'm happy to get it is it, it gives me an opportunity to say through the legislature uh, to uh, both Durham and UIT that it's really important that they do everything they can to work together and ensure that that, that partnership, which actually is a fantastic model for the rest of the province, uh, remains successful. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, my job isn't to micromanage these partnerships or micromanage these, these arrangements, uh, but, but my job is to uh, put, put forward an expectation to all parties that they're going to do everything they can to work in the best interests of students. The members raised the issue with me in the past. I've been to Durham College just recently. Uh, I met with Don Levisa there and, and did a tour Answer. of the college. It is a fantastic partnership. It's a great model. It appears that there might be some more work to do, and I think both of us Thank need you. to make sure that they do the work they need to, to make the partnership work. Minister, the process is continuing on, and quite frankly, there's a, a lot of concern that the IT division may be next on the block for the shared services aspect. This substantially impacts not only the, member, the union membership who are working under Durham College, but then have to move over to, to UIT in the case that they don't move over where these individuals end up. Not only that, but also the impact on the budget of Durham College, as they are the ones holding the original contract. Minister, can you ensure that the best interests of the union workers who are working on behalf of Durham College and UIT, as well as the impacts on the budget, are minimized? Eliminate. Thank you. Minister? Speaker, uh, my expectation of all of our post-secondary partners is they're going to they're be fair in everything that they do. Uh, my other expectation is everything they do is being done in the interests of their students because, first and foremost, I have a responsibility, I think we all do, uh, to see our post-secondary system through the eyes of our students. And I know when going out there, and I, I may have a bit of a conflict here, Mr. Speaker, because my son, I think, has applied and is accepting to go to Durham, and that's one of the reasons I was out there. So I may have a bit of a conflict here, but what, it, what amazes me about that campus is the interaction between the university students and the college students and the programs where you can start in Durham College, work your way up into a university program. It is a fantastic model. It's really important we all work together to make sure it continues to work in the best interest of students. Thanks for the question. Your question, member from Temiskaming, Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Northern Development Mines. Mr. Murray will answer this. The government has announced that the ONT refurbishment shops in North Bay will remain in public hands, but it has failed to outline a long-term growth plan for the division. In fact, it announced, it announced the refurbishment of Polar Bear Express as a way that that to, refer, uh, to revitalize that division, but that's only a part-time job. It won't provide enough employment for the, for, the, for the future of the refurbishment shops. This casts doubt on the government's intentions for ONTC. Will this government act to ensure a real strategic plan is outlined for ONT's future, the services and the good local jobs it provides? 
Minister of Water Development and Mines. Well, thank you very much for the question. I really do appreciate it. Uh, certainly, I was very pleased to be in, in North Bay um, a couple of Fridays ago uh, to announce that indeed we are keeping uh, four of the five uh, divisions of the ONTC in public hands, and that does include the uh, refurbishment shop. And we're very pleased we were able to provide uh, $17.6 million in uh, in work in terms of the polar, uh, improving the Polar Bear Express refurbishment, rail freight as well, and obviously the motor coach as well. We are conscious that indeed uh, there's more more work to be done in terms of the transformation of those uh, divisions that will be held in public hands. That does include opportunities. We see synergies with Metrolink, so we're hoping that will be uh, an opportunity. In fact, it's an opportunity we're planning to uh, have more serious discussions about very, very soon. So this is part of a longer-term plan, Mr. Speaker. It's, the commitment is uh, very strong in terms of keeping the, those lines in public hands, and we look forward to further discussions to continue that transformation. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister. The people in the North, in northeastern Ontario have been waiting two years. They've united them. You've, you've started the MAC committee. The MAC committee has done a lot of good work. Work for a long-term plan. And what we got was an announcement to refurbish part of the ONTC's own rail cars. And that was announced as a, as a strategic plan to save the refurbishment shops. That's not a plan. That's an announcement. And we don't want to hear talk about a plan. We want to hear. We want to hear that there is going to be a strategic alliance with Metrolink. You could do that. They're both public companies. That was the start when when they lost that contract years ago. That's when we realized that what you were trying to do with the ONTC. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I mean, fair game. Um, we are very, very committed to a, to a long-term plan, and I know you don't want to in any way uh, minimize the uh, hard work that was done by the Ministerial Advisory Committee, because indeed they have, and indeed this is part of a full transformation. May I say the Ministerial Advisory Committee is going to stay in place. I asked each of the members uh, when, we, when we made the announcement related to the uh, four lines taken in public hands, will you stay on the MAC board? Will you meet again? We have more work to do. There is work we want to do in terms of a, of a strategic alliance with Metrolinx. That work needs to get done. We need to put forward a, a real business plan that will make it work. We recognize that. But I guess most of all, Speaker, what I want to say is we are so committed to uh, to a long-term transformation of the ONTC, and it's a sustainable one, and I want you to know that Answer. that work will continue with all the advice we'll be getting from the MAC and others like yourself. Any question? The member from Mississauga Streetsville. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, this question is for the Minister of Transportation. Minister, uh, Western Mississauga's neighbourhoods of Lisgar, Meadowvale and Streetsville are perfect places to cycle in the good weather, if that good weather ever comes, on our very many biking trails. Cycling is part of a healthy lifestyle, and in Mississauga we are, much, uh, we are very, very active cyclists. Would the uh, minister please uh, uh, tell me what his uh, just recently announced uh, investment in cycling in Ontario uh, uh, entails, and what can we expect for cycling as Ontario rolls out the program? Thank you, Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, first of all, I want to thank the member for his leadership uh, as a cycling advocate, and uh, his private member's bill on Bike Month is going to be very important to this House. But what we've done is we've set up a fund for $25 million, Mr. Speaker, over the next three years. This will fund municipalities and our partners, the not for profits, in building new models of cycling. Uh, uh, infrastructure and innovation, whether it's in Ottawa or whether it's in Chatham or whether it's in Ignace, every community right now is embracing this, Mr. Speaker. But it actually leads to a much bigger story, Mr. Speaker, which is that going forward, our entire $14 billion a year infrastructure budget will include cycling facilities in every road, highway, bridge, every hospital. So we will become, we believe, in the next decade, the most cycling friendly uh, jurisdiction in North America, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member. First question. In the uh, speaker's gallery today, we have guests. Mr. Jerry Beyer from the Institute of Future Legislatures in the University of British Columbia as a guest of the former member from Elgin, Middlesex, London in the 37th, 38th, 39th, and speaker in the 39th, Steve Peters. The uh, Attorney General on a point of order.
I'd like to correct my record in my answer to the member of Perth Wellington. Apparently, I said Justice Yakabuski when I meant Justice Yakabuchi. I wouldn't want my friends from uh, Renfrew uh, Pembroke Nipissing to be too excited. I have not yet appointed him to the bench. Thank you. Thank you. The member from Ottawa South on a point of order. I do want to add, I did not. Uh, uh, I left out Isabella's grandmother, Jerry, and her Jerry O'Brien, and her parents, Rob O'Brien and Angela Ciccato. Here, here. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.